Welcome back to Set for Life. Today we're in 2 Samuel 14. I'm going to call today's message, Spell It Out. But you ever had to have somebody spell something out for you? I'm a ham radio operator, and I operate all over the world uh, to other operators around the world, and I know how to do Morse code uh, with your with your hand, da 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 and I can do straight key or I can do iambic paddle. It's if you ham guys know what I'm talking about. Hey. The first time I ever did a Morse code contact, I was nervous because, you know, when you're practicing Morse code with um, tapes at the time is what I was using, you, you're just listening to somebody teaching you how to do Morse code and you copy it down. But when you get on the air with it, it becomes real because you're talking to a, a person that you are obligated to respond to when they ask you something. If my head starts to smoke and it gets too busy, I can just pop the tape off and no big deal. But if you're talking to somebody on the other side over there, on the other side of the radio, you're committed. You need to answer the guy, okay? So I got into my first contact in Morse code, and I was sweating bullets, and I sent something to him about what's his location. And in Morse code, you don't ask, what is your location? That's a lot of letters to spell out. It takes longer. So you say QTH, and what is your QTH? What is your location? And he sent something back. And I, I'm trying to copy his his letters down, and and he said something about said something about Morse, and I thought, man, my Morse code must be absolutely terrible. So I asked him again, and I asked him to slow down. I said, QRS, slow down, please. And and I asked him again, what is your QTH? What is your location? And he sent back something again, and I, I had some scattered letters because I was a little nervous, and I was trying to keep up with him. And he slowed a little bit, thank God, but he uh. Something again about Morse, and I'm thinking, man, he must think my Morse is absolutely terrible. Like, maybe he's telling me my Morse is bad? And the more times he told me about my about Morse, the more I got nervous thinking, I can't, I can't even do this. So I, I'm still committed in the conversation, so I had to ask him, uh, what is your QTH? What's your location? I, and then I said, I'm sorry, I'm new. <laughs> and he wrote back, he sent back in Morse code, the name of the town I live in is called Morse Bluff, Nebraska. <laughs> and so he had to spell it out for me because I wasn't getting it. I'm like, oh, shoot. Was, you know, what about my Morse code? It was, it was the name of the town he lived in, Morse Bluff. And I, I, I'll never forget that. That's quite a time for your very first uh, QSO, your very first conversation on ham radio is it was over that so it kind of freaked me out a little bit but I, I recovered we finished the conversation out and it went well so but sometimes you have to have things spelled out for you because you're not getting it and and that's what this guy did for me he spelled it out with you know big lengthy no morse code short hand stuff no qrs no qth the town i live in he had to spell it out because i wasn't getting getting it i was missing something well, today's message is spell it out, and it's going to be uh, where David has somebody who's going to come to him to spell it out for him. Absalom ran away to stay with his grandfather, and he'd been gone for about three years, and David has had no contact with him. It's an awkward, I'm not talking to you kind of moment here. So we need to see what happens from here on out when somebody has to go spell it out for David in 2 Samuel 14 and verse 1. Absalom returns to Jerusalem. So Joab, the son of Zerah, and I'm Texan, okay? I'm a redneck, so y'all forgive me on these, these names. Uh, I know my Hebrew friends, you're going to say, oh, you didn't say that right. I know I don't say it right. I'm admitting it, okay? But uh, let's move. <laughs> I, got a, I got a Texan tongue, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Hey, let me, boy, let me tell you what. So Joab, the son of Zerah, Zeruiah, Zeruiah, okay? This guy, so Joab, the son of somebody, he perceived that the king's heart was concerned 
about Absalom. And Joab sent to Tekoa and brought from there a wise woman and said to her, Please pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning apparel. Do not anoint yourself with oil, but act like a woman who has been mourning a long time for the dead. Go to the king and speak to him in this manner. So Joab put the words in her mouth. Nobody knew how to facilitate Absalom's return to David. They're kind of scared of David. He's the king. David's kind of messed up right now. They're kind of afraid to approach him. It was one of them real awkward things that nobody wants to get involved with because there was no real easy way to go about it, uh, how to facilitate Absalom's return. And now Joab, he had a, a, a military mind. He he had a, a tactics and strategy mind. He liked to figure things out. And so he devised some kind of a way to get some sort of an encrypted message to hint at David about Absalom bringing him back. So he gets this woman from Tekoa to go and speak to him, and he told her what to say. Second Samuel 14 and 4. And when the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Help, O king. Then the king said to her, What troubles you? And she answered, Indeed, I am a widow. My husband is dead. Now your maidservant had two sons, and the two fought with each other in the field, and there was no one to part them. But the one struck the other and killed him. And now the whole family has risen up against your maidservant, and they said, Deliver him who struck his brother, that we may execute him for the life of his brother whom he killed, and we will destroy the heir also. So they would extinguish my ember that is left, and leave to my husband neither name nor remnant on the earth. As a widow, if her last son were to die, that would mean her support would be cut off, her family name would be cut off, it was going to be extremely hard for her to make it, in that culture. She needed her son to keep her going. Well, her supposed son anyway. But the strategy here was to get some kind of a, I hate to call it a sob story, but it kind of is, to try to prompt David to motivate him to doing some sort of an action that he would have to listen to this woman and say, okay, I'll do something. And they're kind of drawing him in here. Second Samuel 14 and 8. Then the king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. And the woman of Tekoa said to the king, My lord, O king, let the iniquity be on me and on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. So the king said, Whoever says anything to you, bring him to me, and he shall not touch you any more. Then she said, Please let the king remember the Lord your God, and do not permit the avenger of blood to destroy any more lest they destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. Okay, so David said he'd take action to resolve her problem, and he told her to go home. Go home. I'll, I'll deal with it. I'll take care of it, okay? But instead of walking away, she felt she had to kind of push the issue a little further. Like, maybe he's not quite getting it, and she wanted to go a little more. So she said that if anything went wrong with the handling of the justice in this, then she wanted David to know that he would not be held responsible for anything that kind of mishappened out of all this. Let the iniquity be on me, she said. So David assured her again. He wanted to assure her beyond that. See, she's pushing him. Now David's trying to reassure back. So they're kind of pushing each other here. He said, if anybody gives you any trouble, you bring them to me and I'll deal with it, okay? I'll take care of them. But in verse 11, even after he assured her of that, she said, she persisted even more. She said, don't let the avenger kill my son. I mean, she's really amping it up here. And David probably thought, okay, this woman is just not hearing me. She's not listening. So he gave her this big drawn out oath. As the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. You know, he... He might be thinking, okay, is she getting it yet? Is she understanding what I'm trying to tell her yet? But remember, this woman from Tekoa is trying to convey a message about Absalom to David. And so I bet she's wondering the same thing about David. 
Is he getting it yet? Is he understanding what I'm trying to tell him yet? (laughs) You see both sides here now. David's pushing, I'll do it. I'll deal with it. She's like, I'm not sure he sees the Absalom parallel about bringing him home that I'm trying to make. So the woman from Tekoa, she amps it up again, yet again. 2 Samuel 14, 12. Therefore, the woman said, please let your maidservant speak another word to my lord, the king. And he said, say on, I can hear him, say on, (laughs) verse 13. So the woman said, why then have you schemed such a thing against the people of God? For the king speaks this thing as one who is guilty, and that the king does not bring his banished one home again. For we will surely die and become like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Yet God does not take away a life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. Okay, this is where the woman from Tekoa is really trying to spell it out for David. She was saying that if he was willing to grant full pardon for whoever this mystery killer was, this son of hers that David doesn't even know, the the son in her story, if he was willing to pardon that guy, a guy he doesn't even know, then She was trying to spell it out and hint that David should also grant a full pardon to his own son Absalom as well, because he's off in banishment. He's run away. She said, look what she said. She said, why does the king not bring back his banished one again? Do you see that? She kind of said Absalom without saying, quote, Absalom. She's trying to hint to him. The point is that she's saying is you would work against your own people, the people of God. Hint, hint, Absalom, he's an Israelite. You would work against him. You'd do all this work to help somebody that you don't even know, though. You would work for my son. You've never seen him. You don't know who he is. But what about your own guys? What about your own guys that need a pardon? You know, without directly saying it, she's trying to spell it out for David that Absalom should be brought back home again. You notice how she said he ought to come back without directly mentioning Absalom because they're kind of scared of what David's going to do, right? These are the words that Joab told her to say because he knew that David was concerned about Absalom. He knew that. So if Joab could get David to forgive this killer, then perhaps David might start thinking to himself, well, if I would do that for him, maybe I should forgive my son Absalom too. You see, you see the strategy now. Joab was trying to motivate David to grant mercy to Absalom and bring him back. Now, we can see this in how Tekoa, the woman from Tekoa, made David take a good look at what mercy is. She said, she said this, she said that God devises means. In other words, He provides a way to bring back anybody that has ever been banished from his sight so that they could uh, not have to remain expelled away from him. He wants that God wants to establish relationship that's been broken. David and Absalom's relationship has been broken at this point. They're not talking to each other for several years. And she's trying to say, look, God wants to bring people back out from being expelled. So it's kind of like, hello, hint, David, uh, are you understanding that maybe since God does this for you, you should do this for, you know, your son over here? The, the point is, if God would forgive us, then we should forgive others. If he would restore us, we should restore others. And so she tried to say it without directly saying it, that Absalom should be offered some kind of a way, devise a means, David, come up with something that would give Absalom a way to return back home again. 2 Samuel 14 and 15. Now, therefore, I have come to speak this thing to my lord, the king, because the people have made me afraid. And your maidservant said, I will now speak to the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his maidservant, for the king will hear and deliver his maidservant from the hand of the man who would destroy me and my son together from the inheritance of God. Your maidservant said, The word of my lord the king will now be comforting, for as the angel of God, so is my lord the king in discerning good and evil. And may the Lord your God be with you. Then the king answered and said to the woman, Please do not hide from me anything that I ask you. And the woman said, Please let my lord the king speak. 
So the king said, is the hand of Joab with you in all this? (laughs) And the woman answered and said, as you live, my lord, the king, no one can turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my lord, the king has spoken for your servant, Joab commanded me. And he put all these, these words in the mouth of your maidservant to bring about this change of affairs. Your servant Joab has done this thing, but my Lord is wise according to the wisdom of the angel of the Lord to know everything that is in the earth. I think she realized she ran a bit long. I think she realized she protested a little too much, a little too heavy. And long enough, though, for David to pick up on the strategy. He kind of, he, he could sense the Joab-like earmarks here in the story. He, he, he felt Joab in this somehow. It's like, I know Joab. This sounds like somebody I know. Is Joab with you in this? <laughs> so before David fully caught on to her, though, she tried to pull her story back just a bit, back into the parable. It was looking a little too personal, a little too close to sounding like Absalom. So I think she felt maybe she got too close to what she, the, the literal point she was trying to make. And so maybe she thought, well, okay, wait a minute. I got a little too direct to the mark. So she backed it off into the parable again because all of a sudden she says, oh, I'm so afraid of everybody. They're, they're, they're going to get my son and they're going to kill me. I think she laid it on a little too thick when she fluffed David up. Oh, you the king, you're so good at telling good from evil. I mean, you're just like the angel of the Lord. It's like, let me flush, fluff him up a little bit. Let's pull on his heartstrings again. You can see what she tried to do. I'm sure she was nervous. I mean, you're standing before the king. I'm sure she kind of went a little overboard a little bit, but David caught on. She said, but whatever you say, that's good enough for me. God be with you. And David, David already assured her several times, I'll deal with it. Anybody messes with you, I'll, I'll take care of it. And now she's saying, whatever you say, I'm good with it. Well, uh, okay. As a man, I'm thinking, look, I already told you I deal with it. Go home, he told her. You need to go home now. Oh, yeah, but oh, my king. And then, okay, I'll deal with that too. Oh, yeah, but oh, my king. Okay, wait a minute. Now she's saying, what if you say I'm good with it? <laughs> okay. I <laughs> think she went a little, mm, a little, a little heavy. Uh, but now all of a sudden, David's like, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Hold, hold on here. Reset. Pause button, lady. Um, does a guy named Joab have anything to do with this? And, oh, and now it's out. Now he knows. And so she had to cough it up. Yeah, Joab, he, he put me up to this. But the reason he put me up to this is to try to cause a change in these affairs that are going on. I, I can just see David. I mean, if it was me knowing the story, uh, what we've read in the last few chapters, David probably just leaned back in his chair and he sighed and thought, oh, first Nathan caught me off guard. Now this woman got me. You know, it's like he's, he just realized he got sideswiped for the second time with another parable. And the parable was designed to make David look at himself, to look at him. This isn't about some guy out there. It's about him. It's about David. You remember recently, Nathan, the prophet, he did the same thing. He sideswiped David with a parable. There was once this guy that stole and he killed and David erupted. Oh, the man should die and he should, he should pay back. And Nathan goes, yeah, you're the guy. You're the guy that did it. That You're the one I'm talking about. It forced David to look at himself from outside of the box. And he had to look back at who he had become, way off target in sin. Now, it has taken people with an outside perspective to make the extra effort to come to him to help David see the error of his ways. You ever had to do that for somebody? You ever ever had that done to you? Where somebody had to come to you and say, look, brother, man, I, I love you, but I need to warn you about something that, that I think is going to hurt you, that you, you, you need to come back. It's not easy to hear those kind of words, but twice people have had to do this now. And so although David did recognize Joab's craftiness in this story, It's obviously he did also recognize Joab's effort, the effort that he was making. He was just trying to help him get past this long, awkward silence that was between him and his own son, Absalom. He realized, okay, I got hit again. Oh, my goodness. But I do see that he's trying to help. He he can understand that. 2 Samuel 14, 21. And the king said to Joab, all right. I have granted this thing, therefore, bring back the young man Absalom. 
So just like how David had told Nathan, this man should die, he probably felt like, okay, I told the woman from Tekoa I'd do something about it. So he probably felt like he was obligated to do it. He's, he, I, I said it, now I got to do it. I have to. And so he says, go on and let's do it, even though he realized he'd been tricked into it. So 2 Samuel 14, 22. Then Joab fell to the ground on his face and bowed himself and thanked the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord, O king, and that the king has fulfilled the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, Let him return to his own house, but do not let him see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, but did not see the king's face. Several things going on here. First, Joab. I think the reason he fell to the ground was not just because it was proper royal protocol to do that, but I think Joab was like, it worked. <laughs> He's not going to kill me for this. Oh, man, so much was riding on this. I was really, oh, I was really hoping this was going to work out right. And apparently it did. So he fell as, oh, man, uh, thank you. I, I realized I found favor. But even though David agreed to have Absalom brought back, he didn't want to see him. He didn't want to see him right away anyway. Uh, he didn't want to see him at all. Why? Well, maybe after, okay, you got me. Let's do it. I said I'd do it, so let's go for it. Maybe by the time they brought Absalom back, David thought, you know what? That sure was low down what they did to me. I'm getting sick and tired of this. Maybe he got mad and said, you know what? Okay, he's back. There, I said I'd do it. I said I'd bring him back, but he ain't going to see me right now. I, maybe he was upset. Maybe he was feeling guilt over the all the uh, the stuff he'd done and the consequences. He's having a hard time. Come on, guys. You, you can relate with him. He's been there. I know this isn't the... You're looking at David's thinking. You're thinking, this isn't the way you should handle it. Well, have you ever been in a situation where you had a hard time handling it too? Maybe David felt like as king, the whole nation of Israel watching him, maybe he thought too quick of a re reconciliation, maybe trying to patch it up too fast. I, I, I know it's been several years since... It, I get it. But maybe he thought there were some people that thought if he patched it too quick, that maybe they would perceive that David was not taking his crime very seriously. So he's got his people on the left side of the fence might get, get angry, and the people on the right side of the fence may have thought, well, we would love that. But he's trying to figure out, maybe he's trying to figure out a way to appease everybody in the matter. It, it's like political parties. You got people over here and over there, no matter what you do, you're, you're darned if you do and you're darned if you don't, you know. So. He's trying to figure out that, what should I do? But I do think David's being cautious. And, and all the fault we can put on him in this point, I think he has actually, has actually come to realize he needs to be careful. Because in the past, whenever he had a knee-jerk reaction and just popped off, oh, that guy should die. Oh, that guy should pay for it. It always got him in trouble because he got uh, kind of trapped in a parable by Nathan and now, this, now Joab, and he doesn't want to react too fast. He, he's... It's like the last time I popped off and said something, it was actually about me, and now I'm the one paying for it. So maybe just the awkwardness of all the guilt, and I better not talk too fast. It's like, don't stick your foot in your mouth. Slow down. You know, maybe that's why he didn't want Absalom to see him right away. And no matter what's going on, there's, there's a lot of things that's uncomfortable about the situation with Absalom. It's weighing on him. Maybe he's got a little, him a little scared. Maybe he's just being cautious. Maybe he's trying to. You know, you ever been between a rock and a hard place? I think David is there. And you've been in an awkward situation before, haven't you? And it was hard to know what to do. But when it came right down to it, let's say something was approaching, you knew you had to do it. And right when it hit, you just weren't ready. It's like the first time I went on the high dive when I was a kid. I thought, oh, I could do that. But when you climb up the ladder, it like looks like it's like 10 miles down. And I walked to the edge of the board and I stopped and I wanted to back up. And the kids at the bottom of the ladder, they're like, oh, no, no, no. You climbed up. Now you got to jump. You can't come back down or you're a coward, you know. And, and I'm, oh, man, now I got them pressuring me. Well, that jump's coming. I'm up there. The whole pool's watching. You know, everybody is, oh, jump, jump. You know, I was scared. And I walked up to it three or four times. And finally, the kid goes, are you going to jump? Do I got to come up there and push you off? You know, it's <laughs> something like that. So I, I eventually it's coming. But how do you deal with it? It's awkward. I don't know what to do. I can just I can I can relate to David being in this spot. Second Samuel 14, 25. Now, in all Israel, there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks from the sole of his foot to the 
crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head at the end of every year, he cut it because it was heavy on him. When he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels according to the king's standard. To Absalom were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of beautiful appearance. So basically, Absalom was the hottest guy in the entire nation. I mean, he was the hunk. He was the celebrity guy. Uh, Every girl wanted him. Every guy wanted to be him. I mean, he was it. And and just for a visual aid to help you understand what he might have looked like, just imagine me with long hair. And that's probably about what Absalom looked like. So that's probably how that went. But I, I stop laughing. I'm just trying, Lord, I'm just trying to help people understand your word better. And I'm even using myself as a sacrifice to help make that happen. So stop laughing. Let's, this is the word of God. Get serious. Anyway, <clears throat> okay, we done laughing yet? Uh, can, can I move along? All right. Just doing my job, Lord. Anyway, oh, goodness. I forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Anyway, unlike me, because I wear a flat top, Absalom had a lot of hair. And and why do we need to know this? Why is this important? Because it's going to have a lot to do with what happens to him ahead in chapter 18. It's a major detail we need to know about how much hair he had because it's going to be part of his demise. But you did notice how he has a daughter named Tamar. He had a daughter named Tamar named after his sister who was violated back in chapter 13. 2 Samuel 14 and 28. You better stop laughing at me. 2 Samuel 14, 28. And Absalom dwelt two full years, two years, in Jerusalem, but did not see the king's face. Therefore, Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. So he said to his servants, See, Joab's field is near mine, and he has barley. There, go set it on fire. And Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom's house and said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered Joab, Look, I sent to you, saying, Come here, so that I may send you to the king, to say, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me to be there still. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face, but if there is iniquity in me, let him execute me. Oh, man, he's, he's ticked. <laughs> he's upset. And why wouldn't he be? David put Absalom off, ignored him for two full years. That's a long time. You know, there's something I got to say about David here. He, if you remember, a few chapters back, it said he was having children all over the land with women, multiple wives all over the place. He's got a lot of children that he's neglected. He hasn't been the closest of dads, okay? How can you keep up with this many kids? But obviously, Joab wanted to stay out of this, okay? He tried to get Joab into it, get me to the king, and Joab wouldn't answer him. Apparently, I I mean, I'm trying to think in his shoes, he probably didn't want to be any more involved with this mess than what he'd already stuck himself into. But after being ignored twice, Absalom, he felt disrespected. I mean, who wouldn't, right? But the problem is he took matters into his own hands with extreme measures to get people's attention. But you can tell that Absalom had become bitter. He had started the deep, deep anger, and you can now see this anger now playing out. He played it out. He demonstrated how angry he was and what he did, burning the fields. And it only gets worse in the next chapter. It only gets more terrible than it has been. 2 Samuel 14, 33. So Joab went to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. Then the king kissed Absalom. Even though they were cordial with one another, even though Absalom came in and did the royal protocol, I'm supposed to bow and all that. I don't know if he meant it or not, but even though they were somewhat yeah, okay with each other, and they met, they did, and it happened. Their encounter, I think, was kind of superficial. It was kind of you know, we there, we did it, we checked the box off, but it didn't have any depth to it. Where was the deepness of the love, love from the core? Oh, my son, you're here. And, you know, dad, I'm glad to be back. It was, you know, David, I don't think he was really quite ready to do this yet. 
was kind of half-hearted. He wasn't all into it. And I think Absalom probably sensed it. I think he sensed it. It's like, you don't really want me here. I mean, did you just bring me back to for the people to see you do this, or did you want me? I mean, I, am I being played here? Am I being used? I, I'm trying to think from David's perspective and Absalom. David's not in it. Absalom, w- what is this all about? Okay. But we're going to see that I, th- I think Absalom really picked up on this, that this wasn't real, because in the next chapter, Absalom is going to try to take the throne away from David. So one thing leads to another, guys. And here's a moment right here that, that's going to bring something later. But let's, let's start recapping all this, this chapter for ourselves here. We had seen in a couple of previous chapters before how blind David had gotten from his sin. And guys, sin will do that to you. And I say that every time. Sin will make you blind as, as a bat. It'll, it'll blind you. You won't be able to see yourself or who you've really become. David had lost his identity. He, he had lost his sense of godly duty. Remember, it said that kings went out to war at this time of the year, but it says David stayed in Jerusalem. He's taking it easy. Yeah, y'all go fight it. I'll, I'll hang here. He's not doing his job. People had to come spell it out for him using parables to get David to see the trouble he was in. He didn't realize how far off he'd gotten. Now, friends, I want to use this story to ask a question, to pose it to you, but what if we got low before the Lord and just said, sorry, Lord, forgive me. I have sinned. Please show me. I'm not aware of what I'm doing wrong, but if there is any way, would you show me, Lord God, please show me. What if we could do that, learn to do that before people had to come tell us? Wouldn't that be better? Is it awkward? It is awkward when somebody has to come say, look, brother, man, I don't want to be the one to have to tell you this, but I, I've got to share this with you because I think you need to hear it. Nobody wants to hear that. What if we could just get before, before the Lord and get low and say, Lord, would you show me before it gets that bad? How can we do that, though? You may be asking, okay, great, I, but how can I do it? Well, I've got somebody that wrote some good words. He has a lot of experience in this matter. As a matter of fact, it was David himself. He learned from all this mess. I mean, he's a mess right now. And you're thinking, what happened to David? Isn't this the guy that killed Goliath? It is. But he learned and he wrote in Psalm 139 and 23, he wrote, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What David was saying here is, God, if I'm doing something wrong, Search me and show me what it is. See where he said, try me? Do you know what a trial is? A trial is something that tries you. (laughs) You ever have something try your patience? You're just trying my patience or tries your endurance. He said, try me. He's saying, Lord, I'm asking for trial. That doesn't sound normal, does it? But that's what he's saying. Give me trial for the purpose of showing me if I'm doing something wrong. It'll purge that out. I know we go through a lot of trials, but a trial was designed to get people to see themselves. God had to do that to Israel after they left Egypt because they got off into sin, so he put them through trial, 40 years of it. He says, you need to see what you're doing here. There's some things that's wrong. You need to wake up to what's going on before I take you to the promised land. Guys, we go through trial. And it's not for us to shake our fist at God and say, how dare you put me through this trial? God, why don't you just take me out of this trial? David says, try me. Come on, try me. I would rather be obedient to you, God. I would rather go through trial and let it turn me out, ring me out to where there's nothing but good, pure obedience left than have everything I want be comfortable. Friends, we need to understand what trial is and what it does. A trial was to help them get them see themselves. Let me explain to you uh, a modern day version of that that I've been through. I had this irritating coworker. Oh my gosh, he drove me up the wall. And all he could think about was money and everything was about himself. And I prayed to the Lord. I said, God, I don't know how much longer I can stay at this job. This guy's just killing me. And the Lord said, Ray, that was you five to 10 years ago. And I thought, oh my gosh. And I had to, I got put into a trial. To help me see something about myself, to see where I had come from where I once was to where I am. And thankfully, it was a trial to help me see how I had improved. But sometimes trials to help you see how you have not improved, how you've gone worse. 
So I was thankful that the Lord put me through that trial. And I'm telling you, when Facebook came out, I started finding all the people I used to work with, and I realized, man, I was a jerk to them. And I started writing all these people. Once I had that new perspective, the before and after snapshot, I wrote them, and I laid it all out on the table. I said, hey, I remember being like this, and I'm sorry that I pressured you, and I'm, I imagine I was probably tough to be around. I'm sorry for my rudeness. I'm sorry for my selfishness. I just laid it all out and said, would you please forgive me? And man, I got about a 10% return. 90% wouldn't say anything. Maybe I was that bad of a guy. I don't know. Uh, But I did get 10% back. I did get some turn back on that. So I'm glad I did it. And it was worth doing it. Now the ball's in their court. I got it off my chest. I asked for forgiveness. Good, Good on my part. But you can see how trial works. It's for our benefit. And David said, try me. Please, Lord, do it. Show me what's wrong with me. I don't want to be going through these consequences again. I don't want to damage people. I don't want to hurt people's lives. I don't want to start a fire and burn the whole house down that takes every loved ones out with it. Try me, Lord. Try me and show me if there's anything wrong in me so that you can lead me in ways that are everlasting. Guys, those are good words, very wise words. God had put David, after his sin, after the things he did wrong, he, God put David into two different circumstances. One was with Nathan telling him about a man that stole and he kidnapped and killed. And the other one now is here with Joab about this killer that needed to be forgiven and brought back. Oh, that's so good. Because that's the gospel, guys. That's the gospel of Jesus. But the problem was, though, when David first heard these stories, these parables, he was so focused on the details of the story. He was so focused on the trial, the problem. I got this guy over here we, he killed. Can you help me? Okay, I'll deal with that. I'll, I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. He said it several times and he made a solemn vow. He was so focused on the details of the circumstances rather than what the stories were trying to tell him about himself. You see the problem. He was so hung up on the details of what was the circumstance of this and that going on that he missed the bigger picture of what the trial was trying to say to him. Remember, David said, try me, Lord, find out if there's anything wrong with me. And if there is, then I can see it and we, I can repent of it and we, you can lead me in the way everlasting. Well, right here in, the, in chapter 14, David is not seeing all that yet. He, all he's seeing is the, 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 the elements of what he has been presented with rather than, Lord, what have you got for me in this? Lord, is there anything for me to learn from in this? Friend, we should always be looking for what the Lord's trying to show us in the trial. He was looking for the details rather than what was trying to be spelled out to him. They're trying to say, look, you need to bring Absalom back. That's what you need to do. And he's, okay, uh, I'll deal with this guy. I'll do- Wait a minute. What about you, David? What, what about you? Don't get so fixated on the details of your trial that you miss what God is trying to show you about you or your circumstance that you're in, things that you need to do that's on a bigger, more heavenly kingdom scale. Don't miss that picture or you're missing the very point of why you're in the trial. But what are your trials right now? Let's look at them right now. You know them, what they are. Imagine, I mean, try to picture your trials. Think about your trials. What's going on? Are you trying to play and maneuver and fix yourself against the trial or Have you taken a step back yet outside of the box to see what God is trying to tell you in the trial? You see, the Lord can eliminate your trial at any time. And you're going to, Lord, take the trial away. Take the trial away. Paul asked the Lord, take the thorn out of my side. And he wouldn't do it. Okay, the Lord can eliminate it. But since he hasn't, then why? Why are you still stuck in this thing? You're praying, Lord, take it away, take it away. Maybe you shouldn't be saying, Lord, take it away. Maybe you should be saying, Lord, what am I missing here about me? Maybe that's the right way to handle a trial. Lord, what have you got to show me in this? Search me, try me. You know my heart. What do I need to fix, Lord, so that I can follow you, so that you can guide me again? Apparently, something's off. You're not being guided in some area of your life, and the Lord's trying to get you back so that he can guide you again. Maybe that's the best way. I'll tell you that is the best way to go up against these trials. Lord, what am I doing wrong? We always need to repent constantly. Oh, I'm saved by Jesus. I'm fine now. No. Produce fruit by keeping with repentance. Yeah, you may be under covenant, but consequences still happen when you do sin. So 
Why has God not done away with your trial yet? You know, maybe he's waiting on you to let go of it. Maybe you still think you're better than God. Set, it, set this one out, God. I can figure it out. I know what I'm doing. But you hadn't fixed it yet. That trouble's still there. Why? Because you need to learn to trust the Lord with it. That's what you need to do is let it go. And then the Lord can show you something about yourself, how far off you've gotten. And now you'll be walking with the Lord and he can guide you better, right? Trust the Lord instead of thinking you can fix it yourself. Don't get so hung up on the details of the trial. Remember Peter? He's walking on the water and the waves were rough and he got scared and he looked at the waves. It says he concentrated on the waves. His focal point left Jesus, who was out there walking. He got fixated on the waves and, oh, these waves are going to get me. Oh, these waves, these waves. And that's when Peter sank into the waves. And the Lord Jesus says, hey, you have little faith. Hey, reach out your hand, grab me. And it's all okay. I got you. He was trying to show Peter, you look at me. Focus on me, not the trial. Yes, the trial's there, but the trial is there to get you to look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your answer. You don't have the answer, okay? <laughs> Let me just tell you, yeah, the world tells you you're good enough to conquer anything. You're not. I'm going to just be blunt, honest. You're not. That's why you need a Savior. Let Jesus deal with it, okay? But God had put away David's sin, and he pardoned David for murdering of Uriah and for all the sin that he'd done. And so David's under covenant, but David should have known that because his sin was put, put away and pardoned, he should have known he needs to do the same thing for his son Absalom, but David just was not getting it. I want everybody here to take your trials, whatever they are. Ray, you have no idea how bad my trials are. That's okay. You don't know mine either, okay? I'm with you in this. Take your trials, whatever they are, and I want you to take whatever your burdens are, Whatever your problems are, whatever your struggles are that you have yet to resolve, and I want you to release them to the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Do it. And say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with it. Now, please, Lord, show me where I got off track and forgive me, Lord God, and let him deal with it. David said, I'll deal with it. You remember, he told the woman, okay, I'll take care of it. And she goes, oh, oh yeah, but, oh, yeah, but. And he goes, oh, okay, I give you my solemn vow. Not, nothing's going to happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, but let me, how about this? He goes, hey, you have any problems, you bring them to me. Okay, friend, if you got any problems, anybody messes with you, you send them to the Lord. You don't go to war with them yourself. You don't try to take care of it. You're not a king. You can't deal with it. Okay, Jesus is. Let him deal with it. Let him take it up. Okay, now remember what the woman of Tekoa said. She said, the Lord devises a means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. Friends, this means that God has given you a way to return to him. And that way is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, okay? So many people walk around in defeat. This is what I want to address. So many Christians, they call themselves one anyway, they're walking around in defeat all day in and day out. Their heads are all hung down. They're so sad. I mean, come on, guys. How many people are going to look at you and say, oh, yeah, I want your God when you look like you're messed up all the time? And the reason that people are defeated like this is because they are more focused on the details of their trial. They are more focused on trying to fix their trial themselves than what God is trying to say to them in the trial. They're more fixated on getting rid of the trial so I can go back to being lazy and comfy and doing anything I want again, rather than realizing I better turn my life and get right back with you, Lord God. And since David knew that his sin had been pardoned, he should have recognized his responsibility to reconcile with Absalom. We know that our sins, those of us in Messiah Jesus, we know that our sins have been pardoned through forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ. Then we should recognize our own responsibility to do the same for other people. Matthew 6 and 15 says, But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Friend, the trial that you're in right now, the difficulty you're going through, 
I want you to step back a minute. Stop looking at the waves. That's not the issue. The trial problems is not the issue. You need to look back at Jesus. That's the problem and let him deal with it. But what are you, you're supposed to learn out of it that you are looking at the wrong thing. You need to look at the Lord. I want you to remember, though, that being a sacrifice, a living sacrifice for the Lord is going to hurt. It's going to have people hate you. They're going to they're going to call you the hater when they're the one doing it. We're the bad guy nowadays. You know, the Christians are the bad guys. I know it. It hurts. But I want you to consider the other people that are involved in your trial that are suffering because of you or with you or you're suffering because of them. Think about these other people. Think about that irritating person that drives you up the wall that is so awkward to you that just like David, you're hesitant to get close to them anymore. You don't want to restore a relationship. You'd like to have it, but you don't want to do it. And you're supposed to restore relationship in the way that God did for you. Let me tell you how to deal with that. You forgive them. Yeah, but you don't know what they did. Okay, I understand that. They're saying the same thing about you. Let it go. Be done with it and reconcile with them. Why? Because the Lord God did that for you. We're the ones that did something wrong to him. He didn't do anything wrong to us. But he still wants to reconcile us. If you want to be like Jesus, if you're truly saved in Jesus, you'll do as he did and reconcile with these people. David was so apprehensive about seeing Absalom because of the guilt over what he'd done. He was concerned about how everybody else was going to react to it. What's everybody going to think? Am I going to make everybody happy or not? Maybe I'm not ready. So he played it cautious. I think he played it over cautious. And he stayed at such a distance that it wasn't real anymore. It wasn't godly. His heart wasn't in it. I know you've been hurt in the past. I know you've got your reasons why you don't want to get close to people anymore, but you know what? That is no reason for you to not do your job as a believer who was supposed to reflect the love and forgiveness of Messiah Jesus. You're supposed to put forth the same mercy and grace that Jesus gave you. Jesus, our King, he has no sins of his own that would cause him to play it careful with you. Jesus didn't like, you know, I forgave you, but just stay, stay away from me. Stay back. I, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Maybe later, maybe in another few hundred years. I'll be dead by then, Jesus. Yeah, well, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. I, I, you can't see my face. What if Jesus said that to you? David told Absalom to come back, but David refused to let him see his face. That's the, another, the last thing I want to talk about, but it's a big problem. Yeah, come back, but you can't see me. Well, wait a minute. That's not really coming back. Imagine if the Lord God said, yeah, you can come on home to heaven, but you can't see my face. Well, then what's the point? Why am I here? What are you doing with me, God? I thought I was here so I could be with you. I want to show you a Bible verse that talks about what it's going to be like in heaven. Okay, look at this. Revelation 22 and 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face. The servants of the Lord shall see his face. He's not going to say, yeah, come on, but, but no, you can't see my face. I want you to understand what the Lord's trying to say. You're going to come here, and you're going to get to see me too. It's not this awkwardness that he's going to be so standoffish. It's not going to be a superficial, fake, half-hearted, forced, awkward surface love. It's going to be the real deal. His love for us is very deep. And like the woman said, like water spilled on the ground, it can't be recovered. And so we must die. But that is not what God desires. Rather, he has devised a way so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. And friends, that way back to the Lord God is through our Lord Jesus Christ. He made the effort, even though it was awkward, he made the effort to come and die on the cross He came himself. He didn't put it off on anybody else. He did his job as a king. We should do our job if we're in the kingdom as servants. But he came to spell it out for us that by through Jesus Christ dying in our place, that we could never have to be hidden away from his face. Ezekiel 39, 29. 
and I will not hide my face from them anymore. For I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. You are not worthless. You are priceless. Messiah Jesus died on the cross to redeem you. I hope you understand that today. Get on your knees and say, Lord, forgive me. Show me what I'm doing wrong so I can follow you rightly. You'll be set for life.